Amen. What a wonderful way to end the evening on a Wednesday than to come together and worship <laughs> and have a prophetic song and a prophetic word. Ooh, I was, how many of you were touched by the song about God? fire in his eyes and the fire of the Holy Spirit and how much he loves us. He is encouraging us. He is drawing near to us. And, and I'm really excited about what God is doing. And so let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for tonight. Father, we are very grateful that you are moving. We can feel your presence in this place. We thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> We are so grateful for your presence here tonight. We are so grateful that you are visiting us tonight, that you are encouraging us tonight, that you are speaking to us tonight, and we are grateful for all that you are doing, all that is on the horizon, and that you are getting your people ready for more. And so, Father, give us ears to hear what you are saying. Help us to understand the language of heaven. Help us to understand the ways that you are speaking. Help us to understand and give us ears to hear. Open the eyes of our heart that we may see by the Spirit, that we may hear by the Spirit of God in a new place, in a new level, and at a new level with you, Lord. Well, Lord, we ask you to bless your word tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we all said, amen. I like to pray. <laughs> I guess it's evident, huh? Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, you know, the Lord has been doing this sovereign work. I have been calling, I started calling it just today, a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit in prayer. We have, we have Monday night prayer, and it's been incredible. This past Monday night was very powerful the song of the Lord being released, uh, people in travail, uh, excited, uh, just what God is doing. He's visiting us again. We have carrier prayer that's happening, has happened once, and, and it's going to happen again. May 3rd will be the next carrier prayer on Fridays, and that's involving so many people, people getting involved, and God's awakening uh, what are you carrying? Awakening us to the fact he has placed promises in us. He's placed gifts in us. He's placed burdens in us. And he's awakening us to those facts. He's stirring us up to do his work. We often think that it's our idea to seek the Lord, you know, or, you know, I have sometimes people come to the line and I was this way. I'm just so hungry for God, but I just, you know, and, and it, it, I had some lady tell me, well, that's the Holy Spirit in you putting that longing for him. I'm really trying not to cry tonight, but I just feel his presence so strongly. And he is putting that in us, a longing for his presence. He's putting in us that desire to pray and to seek his face like we haven't done. And he's giving us an unction of his spirit to do that. He is stirring us. The Hebrew word for stir is to arouse, to awake or incite, to agitate to cause one inward commotion, to disturb his calmness, to move, to put into action. How many of you have felt the stirring of the Lord? Sometimes we get a stirring, we, we, we weep, we get very broken about a situation. I can get very annoyed about a situation. And you know, it took me a little bit to learn, oh, I need to pray about that. That is a stirring of the Lord to pray about a situation. And so you have to be conscious in asking the Holy Spirit to help us understand, what are you showing me, Lord? Help me to understand the kingdom of heaven, the ways of heaven, the ways that you speak, and the language of heaven. So we understand hand signals. We understand all kinds of things in this realm, right? Like if I ride a bike, we know... I'm not really great at that, but you know, like right turn and left turn and stop and all. Oh yeah, this hand. Well, 
okay, but you know, we know those things, right? We know body language, we know cues, we know all this stuff. Well, see, the kingdom of heaven has its own ways of communicating. The Lord speaks in multiple different ways. He speaks through his word, the still small voice, the burden of the Lord, the unction, you know, there are many ways. So we, and so I've been really asking the Lord, help me to be sensitive to Holy Spirit. What am I feeling in my spirit? What am I perceiving in my spirit? That really annoyed me and aggravated me. Why? Because if God has done that, he's awakening me to see, oh, I should pray this. I should pray this way. I should do this way. Oh, that made me so broken. Okay, Holy Spirit, what are you showing me? Help us to hear. We see, and so I want to give some examples because we think stirring, but the word stir is used a lot in the Old Testament. We can see examples of God stirring hearts to do his will in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. God stirred King Cyrus of Persia to fulfill a prophecy that was given by Jeremiah years earlier. God stirred him up to release the captives to go back to Judah and to build a temple to the Lord. And it says in Ezra, I think 1 5, 1 15, he stirred up King Cyrus. Then he stirred up the families and the priests to want to go back to that land. They had been living in exile. They had been living in exile in Babylon. I believe the Lord is stirring us up. He is stirring us up to remember our promises. He is stirring us up to know that there is more on the horizon. The people, the Israelites, they got comfortable in Babylon. They got used. They'd been there for 70 years. They gotten used to the culture. They, and, I mean, they still, they, they followed their own culture, but yet they began to get blended in. When you live in another place for 70 years, you can easily get swayed away from your own culture. Daniel stayed true. There are those that did, but a lot of a majority of them strayed. And so it would have been easy to stay. But God stirred up his people to remember his promises. He stirred up men like Daniel to pray, to fast three times a day to seek the Lord. He was praying the prophecy that Jeremiah had said. Let my captives will go back. My people will go back. And the Lord is stirring us up to pray. He is stirring us up to seek him, to come out of our places of captivity, to come out of places where we have been imprisoned, to come out of places where we have been held back, to come out of places where we have been bound, to come out of those places and step into his promises, to step into the things that he has for us. Hey, Hey, Exodus 35, this is the Lord stirring up people to bring offerings so the temple could be made. Haggai 1.14, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, to gov the governor of Judah, to, and the remnant of the people so that they would come and finish the work of the house. There's a stirring of the Holy Spirit that's happening in this house and happening in the people, happening in the intercessors, and God is on the move. God does nothing, but he does it through men and women of God, and he does nothing but an answer to prayer. So he's going to stir us up to pray. He's going to stir us up to pray what in what he wants to do. He's going to put the burden of the Lord upon you. Hey, because then you're going to pray it back to him. It's a transference. He's going to give you a burden. You're going to pray it back to him because that's what he wants done. And then his will is going to happen and things are going to change and things are going to move. But I feel like we've, the enemy has held us in a place where we have had unbelief, we have had fear, we have thought it would always be the same, but the Lord is breaking that. 
and we are going to have to persevere and we're going to have to press through those barriers by the Spirit of God. He is stirring us. He's awakening us for you to take action to reach your kingdom potential in him. You matter. Your prayers matter. Your voice matters. What you say matters. I perceive that the enemy has tried to steal your voice. He's tried to steal your prayers. He's tried to keep you from praying and because you think it doesn't matter and it doesn't make a difference. I began to contemplate that uh, a couple of weeks ago. Well, actually, I'll tell you my little testimony about this. I'm all over in my notes, just so that you know. About three weeks ago, you know, I... How many of you have a routine? I'm so great at routines. I get up, I have my coffee, I go to my prayer room, my office, don't talk to me, and I turn my worship music on, and I pray, and I read my Bible, then I get ready for work, and I go to work. About three weeks ago, I had got up, and I felt, on a Friday morning, and I felt, well, I felt very rough and very tired, and I just was very real with the Lord and said, Lord, I just feel like I'm just, this is just a routine and I'm just praying. How many of you have ever felt that way? And just so honest with the Lord, I need help here. You have got to stir me. And the Lord began to bring uh, repentance, conviction. that I did not pray like I used to pray. I haven't been praying like I used to pray. I haven't been worshiping at home like I used to worship. We just kind of get busy. We just kind of get and do our thing. You know, Lord, thank you for today and, and praying over a family. I had a list and I went down my list. But there's more to prayer. There's a communing with the Lord in that time of prayer. And the Lord began to convict me that you are not praying. You are not spending time with me. I miss your face. And I cried for three hours in repentance. God, forgive me for not spending that extra time with you. Forgive me for not spending extra time in worship. Forgive me of thinking that my day and my busyness is more important than spending extra time with you. Ah, I was so broken. And one of the things that came out of that is I, I had somewhere along the lie, line believed a lie that it didn't matter if I if my prayers really mattered. Like up here, I know that it's not true, but somewhere you don't know. You know, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the word of God that divides the soul and spirit until the Lord really began to speak to me about that. And he reminded me of places where I had a, sky was little. I did not have legal right as her guardian at that point, but she lived with me. And her mom and her dad both came and said, I'm going to come and take Sky." And the places they were in were not a good place. And so I prayed. I had fear. I prayed. I went to my friend's house. We prayed. And we walked. And we prayed. And she prayed when I couldn't pray. But God showed up. And he broke fear off. And he began to give me a word to pray. Apply the blood of Jesus to the doorposts and declare that the destroyer must pass over. And the more that I prayed that, the more anointing and authority began to come. And after probably, I don't even remember, 20, 30 minutes of praying, declaring, there was a peace that came. We had prayed through. I went home, went to bed. I had a dream that a bear, a grizzly bear, was coming to get Sky, but I had gotten to her in time, and, and he didn't get her. And the next day... Dad couldn't come and get her. The next day, Mom couldn't come and get her. 
what if I had not prayed that prayer? What if I had not made that declaration? What if I had not obeyed the unction of the Holy Spirit in that scenario? What if I had not prayed? They would have come and got her. I would have went after her, but God saved us. Your prayers matter. So I feel that fire building and out of that place of repentance, out of that place of turning and, and bearing fruit of repentance, there has been in me a passion, a passion for prayer, a passion to seek the Lord, a passion for the things of God. God is speaking to me in dreams. He's bringing refreshing. He's bringing a strength. But see, he's getting me. And, and, I, and I was talking to Pastor Gary about this. A lot of times I'm like a forerunner. He's getting us ready to press in. He's getting us ready to bear the burdens of the Lord at a higher level, understanding the kingdom of God and his principles so that we can see his kingdom come and his will be done in our lives and our circumstances and our situations. You know, the Lord, I just want to say the Lord was not angry with me. The goodness of the Lord leads us to repentance. And I was so broken because he loves us so much. There was no condemnation. He was just saying, hey, I miss you. I miss you. And so God is doing a new thing. E.M. Bounds is one of my favorite authors. What the church needs today is not more machinery or better not new organizations or more and novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men of prayer, mighty men in prayer. The Holy Ghost does not th flow through methods, but through men. He does not come on machinery, but on men. He does not anoint plans, but he anoints men and men of prayer, men and women of prayer. Lord, release in us a spirit of prayer. Release in us a spirit of intercession. Let us be men and women of prayer on our faces before you, before we go to work, on our faces at noon before you, praying for our families, Lord, on our faces in the evening time before we go to bed, men and women of prayer who will help usher in what you want to do by the unction of the Holy Spirit. It. Hey, hey, he also says the prayers of God's saints are the capital stock in heaven by which Christ carries on his great work on earth. The great throes and mighty convulsions, convulsions in the world have come about as a result of these prayers. Earth is changed revolutionized. Angels move on more powerful, more rapid wings, and God's policy is shaped when the prayers of his people are more numerous and more efficient. Ian e. Bounds' purpose in prayer. As I was reading Ian e. Bounds uh, the other night, one of the things that he said, men of prayer shape the next generation. Men of prayer shape. <laughs> They shape. I never thought about that. But when you are with the Holy Ghost and you have his anointing and you have his plans and his purposes, and I thought about this place and I thought about our pastors and I thought about our apostle shaping a generation through prayer, through fasting, hearing what God wants to do, shaping a generation, raising up a generation, men and women, young men and women of prayer, men and women of holiness and purity, men and women of the word of God, men and women about the gifts and doing what Holy Spirit wants to do, shaping. Wow. Shaping. Whew. 
And it is not something that we can do or Pastor Jeff can do in his own strength. It is the Holy Spirit who changes a heart. It is a Holy Spirit who changes a life. It is a Holy Spirit that brings strongholds down. It is a Holy Spirit that brings a change in the way that we think. It is a Holy Spirit that exposes lies. It's the Holy Spirit that brings deliverance. It is the Holy Spirit that brings repentance. It is the Holy Spirit that shapes a generation. But he looks through men for men and women who will yield to him and not to be about methods, not be about what we used to do, not be about routines. But he's looking for men and women with a boldness to step out in the things of God, yielded to the Holy Spirit and to make a difference. And we have that ability to shape our families, to sh- thought about that, to shape our children as we fast and as we pray and as we cry out to God. God on their behalf that the Holy Spirit will come and he will move in our hearts of our children. He'll move in the hearts of our grandchildren. He will bring about the changes as we yield to him. God is releasing fortitude in prayer. Now I had to look that up when the Lord spoke that to me. Merriam-Webster defines fortitude as a strength of mind that enables a person to encounter danger or bear pain or adversity with courage. Fortitude, biblically, is defined as that strength to courageously endure adversity, temptation, spiritual assault, assault which the Lord graciously supplies by his spirit and through the promises of his word, he gives us fortitude. He is giving us fortitude. It's not just a strength, a physical strength, but it is a mental strength. It is a mental strength. He, we, and I thought about it as we've come through these tunnels of God tearing down lies and remo- breaking off curses off of us that he's releasing into us an I can do this. God can do this. God can change in my family. God can make a move in my children. God can do this. A fortitude that says my God can do this. My God can bring change. My God can touch the situation. My God will supply because we've just been in a season where the enemy has put blinders and some of us didn't even know we had blinders on. But he's, hey, ah, he is removing them and putting a fortitude so that we can press in prayer that we know God's faithful to his promises. We know what God's promised he will do. He will give us answers. He will give us strategies to do what he's called us to do. In the Old Testament, the principle of fortitude can be seen because it is not actually there. You don't see the word fortitude in the Bible. But in Joshua, the book of Joshua, God told Joshua multiple times, be courageous. Be mentally tough, be mentally strong. Because see, it's not by might and it's not by power, but it is by the Holy Spirit. So we have to have a mental strength and a fortitude that says, God can do this. Amen. God's people needed more than physical strength as they crossed over into the promised land. They needed mental, emotional, spiritual strength to endure conflict, adversity, and temptation they would face. They needed fortitude, and so do we. God's calling us to be overcomers. God's calling us to be strong in him like we have never been strong before. The Apostle Paul had fortitude. He faced multiple battles, multiple afflictions, but had courage. He remained steadfast. He felt he held on to his confession of hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Hebrews 10, 23. As believers were called to stand firm and hold fast, there's a strength in us. There's a boldness coming in us. We are arising with him because he is doing it. Last Thursday evening, the Lord began to, this is really the heart of my message. This, uh, the Lord, of course, speaks to me in dreams a lot. He began to speak to me about intercession through this dream. And in the dream, <clears throat> uh, we were like in a cave. And it was like a, I would call it a tourist cave. You know, 
uh, it's been a long time since I've been in a cave, but you know, they're usually nice. And like this floor was polished and super great. Well, Pastor Jeff, I was staying there. Pastor Jeff came, he had this rope in his hand and at the back of the cave was a steep drop off and it dropped down into like this dark pit. And he said, he, he takes me over there and I, and I told him I'm, I'm scared of heights. <laughs> and then he said, he said, well, I want you to hold this rope. I'm going to jump in there. And I said, I, I don't think I can hold you. <laughs> I don't think, I don't have enough muscles here to hold you as you jump over. So he got this other young lady. She's in her 20s. She goes to church here. But she's like as big as this stick down here. And he's like, have her help you. And I'm like, oh, we're going to hold you jumping over this. And that was the end of my dream. But when I woke up, I knew the Lord, I knew the dream was from the Lord. And I began to ponder about the phrase holding the rope. We use it a lot here, okay? Uh, Ever since I've been here, especially in Renewal, we had a book on Monday night prayer called Holding the Ropes. And we prayed for people We still do that. We pray for people that we have ordained uh, in in our over. uh, We have ordained, um, and we would commit to pray for them every day. And we handed out cards this a couple months ago here, and we commit to pray for them every day. And there are people that are in ministry here and in the nations. And so uh, I like I knew it, but I thought it was a term that was just for here. How many of you know that it's not? Like, I had no idea. But you know, I love that, that I didn't know because I knew the dream was from God when I began to do some research about it. <clears throat> Will, this term was initially used uh, in conjunction with William Carey. William Carey uh, was, was a missionary that went to India in 1793. I'm going to read you a little bit about this. William Carrier is widely recognized as the father of modern Protestant missions. He was an exceptional tent maker. Over a span of 41 years in India, he dedicated himself to discipling a nation and transforming its culture. Transforming. He was a man of prayer. At a time when many of his contemporaries believed that cross-cultural missions was only reserved for the apostles of the first century, he was breaking barriers. When people called Carey a genius, he humbly responded, I can plod and persevere. That is my only genius. His journey was not solitary, though. On an emotional farewell before departing for India in 1793, Carey famously said to his dear friend Andrew Fuller, Now get this. I was so amazed. I will go down into the pit if you will hold the ropes. Fuller's unwavering reply was, whilst we lived, we should never let go of the rope. He went on, Andrew Fuller, you read a lot about William Carey. But Andrew Fuller upheld his commitment to carry. He, by chairing his sending missionary agency, he advocated for missions. He preached it fervently. He raised funds. He never set a foot in India. But he prayed. He prayed and he never let go of the rope. And he was successful. Carrie was successful. The missionaries in India and other early fields can concentrate on their ministry in the field because they knew Fuller was advocating for them back home. Holding the rope is so important because of the other people that are at the end of the rope. And I believe the Lord is awakening us to our places of, of responsibility in this house as an apostolic sending center. We have an apostle who goes all over the nations. We support missions. We support men and women in the nations. And our sphere of responsibility is only going to grow. Pastor Jeff in the dream, I'm going to skip here. First thing, 
we have to face our fears. God wants to take us beyond our fears and put a boldness in us. Acts chapter 4. When they were released, they went with their friends, reported, so they had gotten in trouble for preaching the gospel in Acts. They went and reported what the chief and chief priests and elders said, and when they heard it, they lifted their voices together with God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in it, who shut the mouth of our who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, I'm going to jump down. Now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal. Signs, wonders performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. When they prayed, the place that they were gathered together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. The Lord wants to take us beyond our fears. He wants to reveal that your prayers are powerful. Your prayers for Pastor Jeff, your prayers for men and women in the nation are powerful. Your prayers for your family are powerful. Your prayers for your children carry power. You have been given authority in your family and in those situations that you are in, you have an authority by God to pray in his kingdom, to make a way for him to come and make his will to be done. Pastor Bobby preached about it. He said, when we pray, we're inviting God into the situation. When we pray, we're saying, Lord, minister to them. Lord, come into this situation. So you have authority to pray where God has placed you to pray. And the Lord is stirring you to pray those prayers that bring a breakthrough. Hey, Prayers with authority and with confidence to know that you are called. The next thing is to drawing in the next generation. We have been doing that in carrier prayer. They've been really, you know, the catchers, the carriers and the catchers. And we are believing God to raise up a generation because we are all going to work together. It is a multi-generational church that we are called to stand in the gap and hold the ropes. And it is a team effort. We cannot do it. I cannot hold Pastor Jeff hanging down a cliff. I'm not sure the girl with me, but we could get a bunch of people. We can do it by the power of God and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We have responsibility. Hey, hey, you have an authority to pray. You have an authority to be where you are. You have God-given anointing and authority. And we will work together as a team. Whew. Jesus didn't do anything by himself. He had a team with him. He appointed 12 as apostles. He sent them out two by two. We are a team. Some will go to the nations, some will pray, and some will, will, will help provide. We're all called to be a part of that. Hey, and I believe the Lord is awakening us to those responsibilities in greater measure than where we have been. The thing that we have on the bottom of this card uh, that we pray for the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much James 5 16 your prayers matter if you could go away with anything else tonight know that your prayers are making a difference and as we come together to pray together it is making a difference. And God is bringing new levels of freedom to us to step in and obey him. I just have to tell you, and my friend Paula knows this, and, and Pastor Gary and Jaina, well, Pastor, everybody, well, you probably all know this. I am not so super confident about my singing abilities, and I know nothing really about music. But Monday night in prayer... I, uh, Pastor Gary was praying. And as I was walking back and forth, I began to sing in the spirit. And I started to hear phrases of a song. 
and my heart began to beat really fast. So I got really close to Joanna. And I just began to obey. And I just began to sing in the Spirit. And I just began to sing the song of the Lord. And then I laid hands on Joanna, hey, and she sang the song of the Lord. And then it went to a younger generation. Kim began to sing the song of the Lord. But see, your voice matters. Your obedience to the Holy Spirit matters. Hey, the Lord is stretching us beyond our fears, stretching us beyond the lies, stretching us beyond what we think we can do. Because honestly, it is not us, but it is him. And it is a place of humility, and it is a place of vulnerability, and it is a place of yielding. But as we do those things, the Holy Spirit is coming. The Holy Spirit is moving. I want to read a couple of stories. Is this okay? About holding the ropes. So Pastor Jeff jumped down into a pit. And we love him and we will pray for him, whatever it takes. But the pit was dark. We had been in a cave that was polished and excavated and we had, were holding ground. But we're headed, we're headed to take crown. We're headed to uncharted territory. We're headed to new places in the spirit we're headed to new places in the nations, people that we support going to new nations, new places they've never be, been. We are headed into the pit. We are headed into where God would have us expand his kingdom and his territory. And we, hey, and we have responsibilities to stand in that gap. In uh, Goforth of China, Rosalind Goforth, um, that is Jonathan Goforth's wife, he was a missionary. They were missionaries to China. She recounts a wonderful fa farewell service as they left for the first time on their field of China. One story was told at the farewell meeting that made a deep impression on all present and touched a note which sounded through, sounded through the Goforth their whole entire career. The story was of a young couple when bidding farewell to their home country church as they were about to leave for an African field known as the white man's grave. The husband said, my wife and I have a strange dread going. We feel much as if we're going down into a pit. We are willing to take the risk and go, go if you, our home circle, will promise to hold the ropes. I've never seen this story before either. One and all promised. Less than two years passed when the wife and the little one God had given them succumbed to the dreaded fever. Soon the husband realized his days too were numbered. Not waiting to send word home of his coming, he started back at once and arrived at the hour of Wednesday prayer meeting. He slipped in unnoticed, taking a back seat. At the close of the meeting, he went forward, and all came over the people, for death was written all over his face. I am your missionary. My wife and children are buried in Africa, and I have come home to die. This evening, I listened anxiously as you prayed for some mention of your missionary to see if you were keeping your promises, but in vain. You prayed for everything connected with yourselves and your home church, but you forgot your missionary. I see now why I am a failure as a missionary. It is because you have failed to hold the rope. Wow. I cried when I read this. Oh, God. Oh, God. Help us to hold the ropes. And... And not only the ropes for those in the nations, but ropes for our families, ropes for our children. God, let us not fail to hold the ropes where we are supposed to hold the ropes. God, let us not grow weary in well-doing. Let us not grow weary in praying. Let us not grow weary, oh God. Let us not be distracted, but Lord, stir on us a passion to seek you for those that we are in a relationship and that we are in the, uh, their, our sphere of influence, Lord. Enable us to be faithful holders of the rope. Moving mountains 
for those that we are standing in the gap for. I'm going to read one more. And then I'll go back to that. Your church leaders, your pastors need you to hold the ropes. Your family, the greatest thing that we can do for our family is hold the ropes for them. Holding the ropes for those who've dedicated their lives to taking the gospel to the other countries. Our community, we need to hold the ropes for our community, for our nation, and for anyone that the Lord would put on your heart. He's the God of the burden. He will lay on your heart who to pray for, and he will give you grace to pray. I want to talk about, I have one more story along the same line. We all know who Charles Finney was, a, a great man of revival, carried revival all along the East Coast. And, but there was a man who laid his life down to pray for Charles Finney, and his name was Daniel Nash. He served as pers uh, Finney's personal intercessor. He did have his own ministry. He was a pastor, but he laid it down. He felt like the call of the Lord on his life was to pray for revival and to pray for Finney and for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He was key to the revival that followed Finney's ministry. We can all look at the life of Daniel Nash and see how an example of how important prayer is to see the kingdom of God revealed. When God would direct where a meeting was to be held, Father Nash would slip quietly into town, seek to get two or three people to enter into a covenant prayer with him, a prayer of agreement. Sometimes he had, he had with him a man of similar prayer ministry, Abel Clary. Together they would begin to pray fervently for God to move in the community. One record of such is told by Le Leonard Ravenhill. I met an old lady who told me a story about Charles Finney that has challenged me for over the years. Finney went to Bolton to minister, but before he began, two men knocked on the door of her humble cottage, wanting lodging. The poor woman looked amazed, for she had no extra accommodations. Finally, for 25 cents a week, the two men, none other than Fa Father Nash and Clary, rented a dark, damp cellar for the period of Finney's meetings, at least two weeks, and there, in a self-chosen cell, cell, those prayer partners battled the forces of darkness. Another record tells on one occasion when I got to town to start a revival, a lady contacted me who ran a boarding house, and she said, Brother Finney, do you know a Father Nash? He and his other two men have been at my boarding house for the last three days, but they haven't eaten a bit of food. I opened the door and peeped in at them because I could hear them groaning. And I saw them down on their faces. They have been this way for three days, laying prostrate on the floor, and they're groaning. I thought something awful must have happened to them. I was afraid to go in, and I didn't know what to do. And Finney said, it isn't necessary. They're just have, they just have a spirit of travail on them. Charles Finney so realized that the need of God's working in all of his services that he was sent to was because of Father Nash, who would go in advance to pray down the power of God in the meetings for which he was to hold. Not only did Nash prepare the communities for preaching, but he also continued in prayer during the meetings. Oftentimes he would not attend the meetings. While Finney was preaching, Nash was praying in the, for the Spirit's outpouring upon him. I did the preaching altogether, and Brother Nash gave himself up almost continually to prayer. Often while the evangelist preached to the multitudes, Nash in some adjoining house would be upon his face in an agony of prayer, and God answered in the marvels of his grace. With all due credit to Mr. Finney for what was done, it was the praying men who held the ropes. The praying men who held the ropes. Everything that we do, everything that we have been doing and are doing and going to do is because of all of you that have held the ropes for so many years. You've been so faithful. You have been so faithful to come to prayer and to pray, but I believe the Lord is re releasing a fresh anointing 
of intercession and a fresh anointing of intercession, uh, travail that we will birth those things that God would have that are coming on the horizon, the promises that have been over this house, the things that have been said over Pastor Jeff, the things that have been said over you. We are a team and we will move as one in unity. Hey, hey. Whew. And the Lord is answering. And we are going farther by the Holy Spirit than we have ever been before. If the worship team would come back. Ooh. I didn't get to all my notes, but I just feel like um, that God is moving. And he's looking for us. He is searching. And he is drawing us. Hey, and putting within us fortitude. Putting us in us perseverance. Putting in us determination. He's enabling us. He is the intercessor. Jesus is the chief intercessor. And the Holy Spirit intercedes through us. And when we don't know what to pray, Romans 8, 26 through 28, it says that he will pray through us. He will help us. So when the burden of the Lord comes on us, we just yield to the Holy Spirit who's going to help us to know what to pray and to lift it right back up to him. Then his kingdom will come and his will would be done and it would be established. Hey. If you want to rise to your feet. Yeah. A fortitude to stand until his kingdom comes and his will has be done. A fortitude to hold the ropes for those that are going, for those in our families. A fortitude to stand strong. A grace to obey him, a grace to yield to him, a grace that is drawing us close to him. And even in the song tonight, could hear the intimacy of the Lord in that song. Holy Spirit is drawing close. Ha. Let's worship. I just want to open the the halters. And I just want to invite you to come and pray. Just come and pray. Just come and seek the Lord. Let him stir you afresh. Let him minister to you because it is between you and him. It is a new day. It is a new season. So as we worship, yield to the Holy Spirit and the altars are open. <laughs>